As we get started, we're going to do some looking back because this week and kind of this whole month is a very uh, big time of celebration in our church. You can tell it's kickoff and we're inviting people. But uh, you may not know, just a year ago, this week, actually just a few days before we had our first service, a year ago this week, we were having our first service in this building. And this is a picture we're going to show you of just a couple of days before we had our first service. There was still a hole in the wall uh, that we were praying, Lord, please build the wall, not tear down the wall. God, build the wall. And uh, and it got done. And it was awesome. We also have a picture here of our nursery. We call the nest. Again, the week before we open, a lot of people coming in, painting, decorating, getting things ready. And uh, it's just, it's been pretty incredible. So in the last year to think about what God has done. And to think about what God is still doing and where God is leading us, it is a time to celebrate. And it's important in our lives that we actually stop and we celebrate. And even if this is your first Sunday at church or you're only here in the last few months, we just want you to know God is still on the move in this place. And we are excited about that. We're celebrating that and and just drawing near to him and keep reaching out to people. Uh, Seven years ago uh, this week, we were having our first ever church meeting. Uh, we have a kids ministry now that has you know, anywhere from 30 to 60 kids. Uh, there's me. Uh, time has changed me a bit uh, since we first planted the church. Uh, church planting can be stressful. So uh, that was me seven years ago, fresh out of youth ministry. Uh, our kids ministry, like I said, has anywhere from you know, 30 to 60 uh, kids per week. Here's uh, our first kids ministry here. Uh, some people who uh, are in, some kids who are in our church still, uh, a couple of those kids have moved away uh, with their parents, of course. But uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, we had, also, we had one child who was yet to be born uh, in our church, and you can uh, see him there. In the, and again, the faith of people when they first started, you know, a young, married, pregnant couple to say, I'm going to go join a church plant. I'm going to go give this a shot. And just, it was an amazing time, and it's still an amazing time. God is still doing amazing things, and we are celebrating. As we are celebrating, it's important to know that even in the midst of celebration, even in the midst of dancing, we can have times where we pray for people, we weep with people, we, we, we go through, the, there's hard things that some of you are going through. And we can, in the middle of God's celebration, we can actually still gather together and weep. Of course, as a nation, we look back and we remember and we weep. September 11th. And we know that there still is evil in this world. There still are people who will do the wrong thing. And we can still gather together and celebrate with the strength of the Lord and be able to look back and have sorrow as well. And Christians, I think, have this ability to have joy and sorrow put together and still follow God. So we're going to look today at margin. Margin is the space before your limits, space to celebrate, space to weep, space to do what God wants you to do. We're going to talk today about time. Imagine following God and actually having time left over in your week. Imagine stop saying to God, God, why am I so busy and why am I so tired and why is there never enough time? And uh, God, who invented time, who is the maker of time, has some words to say to us about time. Okay, next week we're going to be looking at financial margin. Imagine having money left over. Imagine that God does not want you living in fear financially. Because fear and faith don't go together. Okay, and we tend to think, well, God just cares about my going to church. No, God cares about every area of your life. So we're going to look at financial margin next week. Week after that, we're going to look at moral margin. And we're going to give some practical advice. And I want to challenge you to take practical steps and follow the Lord, what he's put on you. It's really been cool as uh, over the last week, people have said to me, man, I've watched that sermon and God was speaking to me and I've put some stuff into practice and things have really changed and I really know that I need margin in my life. I need space in my life. It's been cool to see that happen. We're gonna pray today. We're gonna look at scheduling margin. Let's pray. God, be with my brothers and sisters here. Be with those who are weeping, struggling, hurting. God, be with those who are celebrating, 
Help us to realize, Lord, that through it all, you are inviting us to the dance, that though the world attack us and though there are people in the world who would hurt us, we can move forward with your joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. So Lord, help us to follow your word and help us to find your joy in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. Amen. All right, we're gonna look at Mark chapter five. Uh, And so go ahead and turn your Bibles there. Page number's up on screen. Uh, Turn your Bible app if you wanna do that. And as you're turning there, I just want to kind of give a little uh, disclaimer because sometimes I talk to people about time because I've trained interns on time. I've had staff on time. I've talked to other people about time. I've done coaching on time and time management. But sometimes I talk to people in church and they look at me and they, they kind of listen to what I'm saying, but they kind of don't really respect what I'm saying because they go, you don't understand what it's like to work full time <laughs> because you're a pastor. And you really only work one hard day of the week. And I know it might be tough, but, you know, I don't want to get up on stage or anything, but you only really work that one day. And then the rest of the week, every time I see you, you're out at the store and you're greeting people and you're hugging people and you seem happy and happy people can't be busy people. So you must not be busy. And, and then the other times I see you're out eating with people. And so, man, pastors, you like you work a day and then you go out and you shop and you have fun with people and then, you, and then you're eating with people. This doesn't seem that tough. So rest assured, I work more than one day a week. And I will say to you, if you want to talk about schedule, you can come and shadow me for a few days and uh, see what that's like. This week, I got a text at 5.30 a.m. and a phone call at 10.30 p.m. So boundaries are important as a pastor. I talked about that last week. And uh, we started a church plant in the middle of a recession. And uh, if my gray hair has not shown you that it's been hard... uh, there's a lot of time. It's busy. The church is growing. It's busy. There's a lot of need. It's busy. I have five kids. Uh, yeah, that's busy. Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of a doctoral program right now. So keeping everything going. And yes, I hope what you still see is joy and peace and moving at the pace of God. And don't buy the lie of our culture that if someone is not ruined down with the weight of the world, they cannot be driven and motivated and goal-oriented because I am driven and motivated and goal-oriented. And some of you don't know what that means, and that's okay. I still love you. But some of you do know what that means, and you kind of think it's either driven and ruined or just kind of lazy. And I'm trying to say that God is trying to give us a different way. Where we work hard, we do the kingdom will, we, we actually make a huge impact in the world, but we don't have to be driven down and depleted of all life to do it. I think that's what Jesus is inviting us into. Mark chapter five, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I have to say that sometimes the way Jesus does time is hard for me. Check out this story. Jesus goes to the other side of the lake. Verse 22, a leader of the local synagogue whose name was Jairus arrived. He saw Jesus, fell at his feet, and he pleads, Please come heal my daughter. She's in sick. She's sick, dying. Jesus had a reputation as a healer. Jesus, come heal my daughter. And Jesus is in the middle of something. He's got a plan. He, he knows what his plan is, but he's willing to stop that plan and heal someone. Her life depends on it. So far, I'm doing okay with this schedule-wise. If someone's life depends on me showing up, I'll, I'm willing to be interrupted. Okay, I'm, I'm cool so far, right? Let's keep going though. Jesus goes with him. All the people follow. Jesus is very popular, crowding around him. And a woman in the crowd suffered 12 years with bleeding. She thinks to herself, if I can just touch his robe, then I'm going to be healed. Now she breaks the rules by doing this because bleeding carries diseases. And so she's not allowed to touch anyone. So not only does she touch Jesus, who's a holy man, she touches everyone in the crowd to go get to him. She breaks a ton of rules, but she's just so desperate. And she goes and she touches his robe and she feels that she's healed. She's healed because Jesus is the healer. And Jesus, who is on his way to heal someone's daughter, this is important. You got something to do. She's dying. She is literally at death's door. And the father is like, let's go, let's go. Get out of the way, people. Jesus in verse 30 stops. He stops. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out of him. And he turned around the crowd and said, who touched my robe? And the disciples say, look at the crowd. How can you ask who touched me? The disciples have a question. I bet, even though it's not in the Bible, I bet Jairus, the dad, had a question too. Like, what are we doing stopping here? My daughter is dying. Jesus, what are you doing? And I bet in your life, when God has not shown up in the time frame that you have, you have asked the same question. God, what are you doing? 
Where are you? But Jesus turns around. He looks for this woman. And the disciples say, who can you ask who touched you? Everyone is touching you. Okay? But Jesus takes even more time. He keeps looking around. And the reason for this, the reason he looks for this woman is to protect her social reputation. She's been unclean for 12 years, a social outcast for 12 years. And if she's not restored publicly, she'll probably be an outcast for 12 more years. Because how do you convince people a private issue like bleeding that you've been cleansed? It's going to take her 12 more years to convince people. And so Jesus takes the time to restore her social reputation because Jesus cares about her social reputation as well. Okay, God cares about every area of our lives. And she's sitting here, he's looking around, he's looking around, he's looking around. Verse 35, uh, she's healed. She, Jesus says, go in peace. That's verse 34. Verse 35, while he was still speaking, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, your daughter, your daughter's dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. You see that word Troubling. Don't bother Jesus. And some of you feel like, if I talk to God, I'm just bothering him. See, the God who made time has time for you. The God who made time has time for you. And these people say, there's no use troubling the leader. And you've got to imagine that Jairus at this moment has got to feel fear coming up. Fear, my daughter is dead. It's it. It's hopeless. And Jesus turns to him at that moment, and he turns to us, and he says, don't be afraid believe. Don't be afraid. Trust me. Just trust me. One of the biggest things that holds us back in time is fear because if someone comes and steals our time, you know that feeling like you're taking my time. That means then the rest of my day is going to be ruined and that means I'm not going to sleep well and that means the rest of my week's not going to go well and that means everything's going to be terrible and that means I'm not going to have this. And suddenly when someone takes that, we feel the anxiety and the fear And we want to be interruptible. We want to be like Jesus. We want to say there's going to be times where we have to stop and help people. But when it actually happens, we feel anxious. And we know this is what God wants for us, but there's fear there. And Jesus says, don't be afraid, just believe. Then Jesus takes the time to stop the crowd and doesn't let him follow him inside the house. Then he takes the three disciples and he comes in with the father. And then there's people crying inside the house. And he says, don't cry. She's only sleeping. Now, Jesus isn't lying here. Because if Jesus says she's sleeping, she's sleeping. Now, she is literally dead. But the way God sees reality is the way it will be. Okay? And why is he doing this? Why is he even saying this to begin with? Because he once again is protecting this little girl's reputation. So she isn't the town freak in town who died and came back to life. And people start asking her her whole life, was there a light? Were there hands reaching out to you? What was it like? He's letting her be a normal little girl. He protects her reputation. He brings in just the father, just with the disciples. And he reaches out to her and he touches her and he says in Aramaic, Talitha kum, little girl, raise up. And she's raised from the dead. Okay? Time. If we are going to be followers of Jesus, then we can't just say, God, I want your forgiveness and then I want to keep living my life the way I want to live my life. Because that's not following Jesus. That's just taking something from Jesus and saying, that's just great. Following Jesus means you actually learn a way of living. And when I look at Jesus, I realize I don't do time the way Jesus does. I'm not living his way of life. And to be a disciple means I actually learn his way of life, learn his way of time. Okay? And for me, one of those big things is about being interruptible. Being interruptible. And I don't know about you, but man, being interruptible is super, super hard for me, which is not a good quality in a pastor to not be interruptible. That is not a good thing. I'll admit that right now. How many of you, though, also struggle with being interrupted? Any, anyone kind of like that? Don't raise your hand. You're wasting my time. You're interrupting me. Okay. <laughs> being interruptible is like super hard, right? But we know like God wants to interrupt us because here's the thing. We are disciples of Jesus, which means he is going to interrupt us with his plan, We are made to do his will. His will isn't always going to fit in your plans. So you're going to be interrupted. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Screwtape Letters. And in it, it's about demons and how they tempt people. And he said, one of the jobs of demons is to keep you and I believing that we own time. It's my time, my schedule. How do I organize my time? 
So then when people steal our time, we get mad that they're stealing our time. And he said, if you think about it, it's the most ludicrous thing that we could possibly think. Did you make the sun? Did you make the moon? Can you own it? Can you make time? Can you take away time? You can't do any of this. You don't own any time. Every minute you get is a gift. You don't own time. Time is a gift. You are a disciple. And he says in this book, if Jesus himself showed up to you and me and said, today, this is my job for you. And you're like, Jesus, here you are. (laughs) Woo, this is exciting. Jesus, I'll do anything you want. Anything you want, seriously. And Jesus says, okay, my job for you today is I want you to listen to this person who's gonna babble on and on for about 30 minutes and it's gonna make no sense, but you're just gonna listen to him. And you're gonna be like, no problem. I got it, Jesus. Totally, I'm with you on that. But when someone shows up in our life and they babble on and on for 30 minutes, we go, you're stealing my time. Instead of seeing it that maybe that's God's will. Maybe that's God's will to be interruptible, to do God's will. Margin is not just rest. Margin is leaving enough room in your life for the unexpected. And sometimes the unexpected is exactly what God wanted for you. And we have no room for that margin. And so we miss out on the joy of the will of God to be used by God. Have you ever been interrupted and it was the greatest thing? Because God used you in a powerful way. How many things are we missing because we're not interruptible? That's part of the pace of life. Second is you need to keep track of time. Not keep track of your time. You need to keep track of time. God does call us to be good managers, okay? Keep track of time. Ephesians 5 says this. Be careful how you live. Each, ver- each line of this verse is so important. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Think about your time. Are you being wise with your time? Make the most of every opportunity uh, because these days are evil. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. That's how we should think about time. What does God want me to do? That's how we should think about time. Keep track of time. Have you ever done that? You ever gone through a week and said, I'm going to keep track of everything I did this week. And I want to challenge you. Do not say to anyone that you're too busy or you're too tired until you've done this. That's a challenge. Because you don't know if you're too busy. Because you don't even know how you're spending time. You don't even know what you're using your time on. Until you know that, you don't actually know if you're busy or if you're just the most horrible waster of time that you've ever met. Okay? Okay. The average American spends 28 hours per week on TV or entertainment. By the time you're 70, that is 10 years of your life. Make the most of every opportunity. Know what the Lord's will is. I think you need time to unwind and relax, but 10 years might be a waste of your life. And if you get to the point where you're overwhelmed and you think this is just disgusting, you might do what I've done before and just have an entertainment detox. Like turn your smartphone into a dumb phone. Don't watch the screen. Don't look at TV. Don't do any of those things because we say, God, I got no time. I got no time. I got no time. But my show's on. Whew, that's important. <laughs> Boy, that person stole my time. Oh, but what's happening? Like, friend, happy face. <laughs> and try an entertainment detox. Try to cut everything out and you will experience, brothers and sisters, something that you may not have experienced for years. And it's this crazy emotion that you once dreaded, but now you long for. It's this thing, adults in here, called boredom. Do you remember when? Do you remember the last time you were bored? We're not bored, we're distracted. We're distracted. We can't be bored because we can't even let ourselves be bored. Keep track of your time. Keep track of time. See what happens. See how much time you're spending on work. See how much time you're spending on getting ready. See how much time you're spending with the Lord. See how that works. Keep track of your time. And don't say to anyone else you're too busy until you know actually how you're spending time. That's the challenge. I'll give it to you. All right? Third thing is plan a schedule. Craig or Shell says this. Many people are robbed from a life of significance not because they're undercommitted, but because they're overcommitted. You hear the things that God wants you to do and you just go, I cannot fit that in. Plan a schedule. Plan a schedule because the thing is you are made to make a difference. You know it because you feel alive when you're serving God. You feel alive when you're serving God, but you're too busy to do anything more. Leave margin in your life to make a difference. See, you guys have seen this before probably, and this is kind of a, a thing kind of popular in the business world about big rocks, medium rocks, and small rocks. I only have big and small 
Because the thing is, in the business world, this is really used as an illustration of if you're going to do tasks, do the hardest and the biggest tasks first, and then the medium ones, and then the small ones, and that's how you get them all to fit. But here's the thing, I'm not using it that way. Because I don't think that's the most important thing. Because I know people who have all their tasks lined up, and they're very efficient doing their tasks, but they don't have their life in priority. Okay? And I think the big priorities of life are God, family, and friends, our family. Okay? And... Thank you. Okay. And, and rest and time to plan. We're going to talk about rest if you don't think it's one of the major things. And I think those are these big rocks, but here's how most of us feel. This is the limit on how much time you have. And we're not below the limit. We are overflowing and you cannot even fit in God or and you kind of rotate these big rocks. Okay. And I'm going to give you that challenge today. Okay. And the challenge isn't just, hey, try to squeeze God into the little areas of your life because these big rocks don't squeeze in. Okay? And that's what happens is we take the most important things in our life, like family and friends, and we try to squeeze them into our lives, and it doesn't really work. And so I'm going to give you a challenge today. If I can, this is a challenge right here, apparently. Okay? I'm going to give you a challenge not to try and squeeze things in your life. I'm going to give you a challenge to empty your schedule. Next week, you have nothing planned. Your schedule is 100% open. I'm going to challenge you on that. Because you've tried long enough to squeeze in what's most important. You've tried long enough to put first things last. And I want to challenge you to put first things first. And I say that first thing, it's God. To put God first, okay? Go ahead and let's put that slide up there. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Okay, seeking God first. Because the thing is, God is the fuel of our life. So if you're going, I don't know if I have time for devotions. I don't have time to put God first. Okay, do you have time to eat? I give you permission. Any day that you don't eat, you can skip your devotions. I gave, I gave you permission. You have it right here, right here from your pastor. Don't eat. You can skip your devotions that day. You know why? Because God is the food of your soul. And you know what happens when your soul goes without food? You experience hopelessness and despair and longing that you fill up with things that don't work, like terrible junk food. Your soul can only be fed on God. Only. He is the only food for your soul. And most of us, even those of us in the church, we have no no time for God, and we are starving. Our souls are starving, and we experience hopelessness and despair. And God says, you got to put me first. I want you to clear your entire schedule and say, when am I going to spend time with God? When am I going to be with God's people? It's not, I don't have time for this. I don't have time to serve. I don't have time to be in group. Of course you have time. Your schedule is empty. Look at you have lots of time. (laughs) You see, instead of trying to squeeze God in, I don't know if you've realized God doesn't squeeze in things very well. Right? He's God. He kind of says, no, I'm going to be the biggest, most important thing in the universe, including your life. Put God in first, okay? Then put in your family and your friends, okay? Your family, okay? Put those things in first, okay? And uh, this can mean, uh, you know, time with our, our kids. This can mean activities. This can mean stuff like that. But here's the thing. I'm not saying you should overactivity your life. You know, I, when I grew up, the mantra was busy kids are going to be, uh, you know, kids that are out of trouble. But now this mantra is out of control. We have kids out four or five nights a week. Our weekends are busier than our weeks and we're running frantically. And if anyone ever stopped to say, hey, are you really happy with your life? You'd say, I don't know. I don't have time to even think about if I'm happy or not. I just got to go. And you know, the danger is we're teaching our kids that busyness is a virtue We're teaching them that you should put God second, third, fourth. You should put family third, fourth. And you think they're going to get less busy when they get into college? We're teaching them how to do life. And we're not living at the pace of God. And and it's just this disease of busy is good. And I think there's some wisdom in in keeping a pace. And there's going to be seasons of your life where work is going to be busy and and maybe seasons are going to overlap but that's different than saying we got to have three four five seasons that we're in right now and it's okay if you're saying hey for the next month or so work's going to be a little bit nuts and you communicate that but there's an end date some of us have lived like hey the next like seven eight years of life at work are going to be nuts 
and think that's going to be okay in your marriage or your friendships. It's not. God has a different way of living. And before you plug anything else in, you need to plug in God. You need to plug in your family. You need to plug in your friends. I mean, actually scheduling it out. And one of the things you need to leave margin for is conflict. Because when you have relationships, you're going to have conflict. And most of us are so busy that if we have conflict with someone, we just write them off. Done. I don't want to talk to you. You're, you're unfriended. Okay? Most of us in our family, if we have conflict, we just stop talking. We don't deal with it because we don't have time to deal with it. I'll just deal with it in a couple of months once we actually want to talk to each other again. And then it builds up and it builds up and it builds up. Leave margin in your life. You need room for that to have good relationships. No one's going to get to the end of their life and say, man, I just wish I'd served God less and spent less time with my family. I've heard anyone say that. We, you know what's important. But you look at this and you go, Scott, that is completely unreasonable and out of control. I could never do that. Do it. Do it. Clear your schedule and schedule God in first and your family in second. Do it. You've tried enough doing the other way. It doesn't work. So try this. See if it works. Okay? And then put in resting and refreshing. Okay? And you may look at it and go, man, Scott, I don't know if resting and refreshing are really like the most important things in here. And I'll just say back to you, like, resting is one of the Ten Commandments. That's kind of a biggie, right? You know, you say, like, I don't murder, you know, so, I mean, I'm okay. And, but one of the commandments is also keep the Sabbath. And this is a commandment that we pretty much just ignore, and we treat it like it's optional. And, and some of us, I've known even Bible people who look at that command, and they say, well, like, in the Bible, Jesus kind of, like, healed people. There might be some things in your life that don't fit. Okay, I'm done that. That was an accident, but I just had to make it work somehow. Okay? Jesus did heal on the Sabbath. And the point is, you can do God's will on the Sabbath. You can do what's right. Paul says, one day is not more holy than the other. So that means you don't have to have exactly one day that you do it. Everyone could have a little bit of a different day. Okay? But the point is that there still is, the principle is still intact. You need rest. Your body doesn't work without rest. You can't just say, I'm just going to stop sleeping. I've just decided I've quit sleeping. I'm just done with it, okay? Your body doesn't work that way. You can get these things to work when you put God in first. And rest is part of it. And I don't mean a day of rest like your chore day. You know, people who are Orthodox Jews, they cook all their meals the day before. Because for some of you, a day without cooking is a day of rest. Some of you are like, amen. Other people are like, I don't, I don't understand. I don't cook any of my meals. It's fine. Okay? <laughs> the day of rest is not the day you do laundry. Unless doing your laundry is a refreshing activity to your soul, you sick, sick person. <laughs> a day of rest actually means a day of rest. Where you're refreshed. Where you do the things that fill you up. That bring energy to your soul. Rest. And refreshing includes exercise because our bodies need exercise. It's a rhythm of life that we live that says it brings, and it's a little different for everyone. For some people, it might be hiking. Some people might be reading. Sometimes people might be with friends. What is it that fills you up? And I want you to actually look at your schedule and before you put anything else in, plug those things in. And right now on your calendar, you've got three, four things on there. You've got your time with God every day. You got when you're going to be serving and ministering, plugging. You got your time with your family and friends, those connections, those memories you've made. And, and you got your time to rest and things that you're looking forward to. When are you going to do something fun that you're just excited about? When are you going to have that refreshing? And now plug everything else in. Now plug everything else. Now plug in work. Now plug in your chores. Now plug in. And some of the things may not fit. Some things you might have to pull back from. Now plug those things in. You won't be looking not only with anxiety. You know the problem with us is we don't just have anxiety with time. We don't just have fear with time. We have guilt. We have guilt because we know the things that are most important in life, we do not have time for. And God's saying you would have time if you put first things first. And I said last week, most of you will not change. You will not have margin in your life because you will, you'll just listen. You'll go absolutely, totally, but you won't do it. And I want to challenge you to do it. Okay, there's people in our church when I've done these little sermon challenges, they've accepted them. We have a doctor in our church who accepted a sermon challenge to give 
15 minutes of time to God to be interrupted. Now, I don't know about you, but this is hard when you're a doctor because time is money. If you get interrupted, that's money that's gone. And if you let someone start talking, when are they going to stop? Anyone else amen to that? Like, yeah, totally, right? So don't even let them start. You know, how's your day going? Oh, it's fine. Okay, good. See ya. You know, <laughs> right? I mean, this is kind of what we do, right? And so he says, I'm going to let God interrupt. Not, not all the time, not infinitely, not forever, but I'm going to give God 15 minutes a day. And, and God didn't take 15 minutes a day. But it was the most amazing thing. He was sharing three or four stories with me. And there were more of times people come in and, and they sensed that something needed to be asked. And so he said, what's going on? Now all of a sudden the doctor is asking personal questions and the person's sharing. Because so few people ask. So few people have time to listen. Isn't that what we should be as Christians? People who have the time to listen. People who have figured out schedule enough to live the will of God and to be his hands and feet. And he started listening and people would talk. And of course, he just said, I'm just going to ignore the clock because I don't know, I'm, I'm anxious. And then it was over. And he'd look up at the clock. It had been 15 minutes. And this happened again and again and again. And there were times where people were praying. There's times where they were crying. And suddenly you're in this medical profession, which is very important, but feeling like God is using me for more than just medicine. That is why we live That is why we follow Jesus. That's what makes us come alive as human beings. And there is a lie going around in the business world that if you just work more and work more and work more, you're going to be more productive. And the lie is true only in a short amount of time. Because if you work more for like 60, 70 hours for a little bit of time, you will be more productive. But if you keep doing that long-term study after study after study has shown, you cease being effective. When you take breaks, you're most effective after the break. You're most effective first thing in the morning. Study after study has shown this, but we still believe this. There's even a quote within the last month where an executive said that Google was founded on a 130-hour work week. Now, there's only 168 hours in the week. Everyone's got the same 168 hours. 130 of those working. That does not produce greater effectiveness and productivity. Those of you I'm speaking to you who are driven people, and you're like, I want to be effective. I want to make a difference for God. I want to make ripples in this world. I want to have impact. And there's a life, you just work, 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 work more, it's going to happen. And you can sacrifice what's most important in your life, and it doesn't work. Study after study has shown that, okay? And I want to give you a little illustration of that too. We're going to clap together. So put your stuff down, get your hands free. We are not going to clap faster. So stay in rhythm, people. This might be a challenge for some of you. I believe in you. You can do it, okay? We are going to clap louder as time goes on. I'll say it a couple times, go louder, okay? So let's do it. Okay, let's go louder. All right, one more time, louder. And stop. All right, we'll work on it. We'll work on it. Okay, it's good. Musically, what do we call the space between the claps? Rest. You rest so that you can hit harder. If you're a driven person like me, The reason you rest is so you can drive harder for the Lord. The reason you rest is so that you can make a bigger impact. The lie going around is if you work more, you get more done. And there are people who will evaluate you just by how many hours you clock in. And that is the dumbest thing. I want to know how many goals you hit. I want to know how effective you are at your work. People think if you're not dragged down with and burdened, you must not have enough work at work and they give you more. Because the lie is, if you're working, you have to be busy and miserable. Instead of saying, no, I'm going to produce more. I'm going to inspire more. I'm going to make more of a difference. And I'm actually going to do it in half the time that you do. Because I know how to rest. I know how to put God first. I know how to put family first. I know how to put first things first. Don't believe the lie of our culture. We've become addicted to busyness. And you know what happens when you do? When there's no rest? This is what your life looks like. (laughs) Louder, louder, louder. And your life becomes a lame golf clap. You can't go any louder. You can't make any more difference because there's no rest. And that's you. Some of you are this. God, what else do you want me to do? What else do you want me to do? What else do you want me to do? Your life is supposed to be applause for heaven. And that includes rest and it includes work. It includes putting first things first. Your life is supposed to be the applause of heaven And it cannot happen if you don't live time the way God's called you to live time. What are you going to do 
I've given you some challenge today. I want to encourage you to put them into practice. Let's pray. God, thank you for Tammy. Thank you for this time together. Uh, Thank you for your word and uh, continue to grow us and challenge us. Thank you for people like Tammy in our lives who can speak directly in love to us. Thank you for her obedience to you. And Lord, what a blessing she is in this church. Lord, for all of us, help us to move at your pace. Help us to put you first and our family and our friends first and rest first. Lord, thank you for your love. And we pray that we will just continue to grow and follow you and learn the way you do life because it is full of joy. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Breaking every chain you set us free. Too often, though, we rebind ourselves with the busyness. Let God set you free. Jump into those life groups. Jump, in, jump into serving with kids against hunger. Find a way to put God first. First things first. Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Experience the pace of God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.